No court reporter. Yes, you are. I got no court reporter. I understand. All right. Your Honor, if it's all the same to you, it doesn't need to be on the record for mine. It does. Okay. 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 It's okay. Be on the record for me. All right. Okay. So please uh, kind of start waking way toward your seats, please. Thank you, sir. All right. Can we check on our jurors? Are they all ready, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mr. App, what do you need? Your Honor, my, my understanding, I planned my opening arguments around um, the, I, I'm not using the PowerPoints that didn't turn in the state because I'm planning my opening arguments around using just paper and notes to speak to the jury off of with the understanding that I was going to have a lectern to speak, uh, to put those papers on in front of the jury. And my, my understanding was from Mr. Steele that there was a conversation with Captain Kendall last week that a lectern, which is in the hallway, would be allowed to be placed up there so that then those papers could be used. I understand now there may there's some disagreement or understanding about whether a lectern can, that's out there can be used or not. I wasn't involved in that particular conversation, um, but I want to say that um, also in order for us to kind of for you to be heard, um, my suggestion is you probably use the podium, and there's plenty of room on the podium. That particular uh, podium that's immovable. And it's also got a microphone. Um, and you're welcome to walk back and forth, sir. You want you walk, you can walk around the well. You, uh, I'll give you permission to do so. You won't bother me. I, so I can tilt this. I don't it says, says there's a sign on. Do it. not it move. Tilt. Do not move. Do not. Yeah, because it's contact. It, it's it's um, part of our evidence presentation system. Well, uh, and that. I mean, there is a, a lectern on wheels that's 20 feet away from here that we, if we could just move it into the... Well, you've also got the challenge of you've got some jurors there available. So jurors are sitting there closer, so I prefer you not do that, okay? You, you have to do the best you can with the table you have. Like I said, you can walk around. Um, you may... You can even put some of your stuff on the edge of the state's table if you'd like to. And, and also, related to that, if there's anybody in the media that is zooming in on any of the things that's involved on any council table, please do not do that, okay? If you are, don't do it. Um, so just please, I uh, just wanted to make you all aware of that, all right? So, Mr. Abb, if you'd like to, um, since uh, all this furniture belongs to me, uh, technically, you are free to put your whatever you need on the edge of the state's table. Um, Can I use the witness stand when I'm giving my... Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I'll, I'll Absolutely. I prefer the lectern, but I'm... Yes, Mr. Sharp. And this is the person who spent most of this morning trying to procure a lectern. Um, there's also... You didn't tell me, though, and we could have gone through this earlier. I, I, I spoke to Captain Kendall last week. I spoke to numerous members of the Sheriff's Department hey. this morning and I was going through every procedure that I was supposed to go through. Well, ultimately, it's my decision, right? I understand. I understand. Okay. There is a, uh, a much smaller lectern um, that can easily be picked up and placed here in courtroom 1D. 
Yes, sir. I want to move the presentation as evidence. We could have discussed this weeks ago, and we could have gone ahead and planned it. I could have brought it over here and test drove it, but you didn't give me that opportunity, so let's move on. Okay. Thank All right. you. Anybody else? Sir, do you know what time you used to no. six o'clock? No, I don't know what time we're going to. But uh, I'll let you know as soon as I'll, I'll figure that out in just a little bit, Mr. Steele, okay? Hey. All right. Who's making the opening statement next, if, if so? Okay, all right. Let me know when you're ready, sir. Uh, we're, just, uh, we're just going to set up on Zoom. Okay, all right. Let, you let me know when you're ready. Your Honor. Yes, uh, Ms. Abt. I'm going to hold it. That, that's fine. That's fine. That'll work out. And Ms. Weaver will yield some space to you, so, okay. There you go. We, we aim to please. Second two, um, Chris, Miss We, I mean, I'm sorry, Miss Love's going to have to send them to you because they're password protected. So if you ask her to send those to you, she can. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I went ahead. And, yeah. Um, I think he said he's ready. Oh, you're ready? Okay, all right. Can we uh, summon our jurors out in room, please? Sure. All right. All right, thank you, uh, Sergeant Ingram. All right, um, does any member of the defense wish to make an opening statement this time? I would, Your Honor, on behalf of Mr. Stilson. All right, Mr. Sharp, you may proceed, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Max Sharp. And along with my co-counsel, the gentleman with the white hair back there, his name is David Botts. And together, we have the honor and privilege of representing Shannon Stillwell. Shannon Stillwell is an innocent man. He's been accused of the murder of Donovan Thomas in 2015. He is not guilty. 
He's been accused of a murder of Shamal Drinks in 2022. He is not guilty. He has been accused of conspiring to violate the Georgia State Rico Law. He is not guilty. Now, I am going to deliver an opening statement that will preview what I believe and what I believe the evidence will show in this case and the evidence that will come in in trial. But before I even start previewing what I believe the evidence will be, I want to discuss with you some preliminary matters um, regarding this case. The first preliminary matter that I wish to discuss is my client's name. Okay? On the indictment, you will see when you look at the indictment that my client is listed as Shannon Stillwell, also known as Shannon Jackson. Okay, and there's a simple explanation for that. You will learn that his mother was a Stillwell, but he was raised by his paternal grandmother, Betty Jackson. So at times he's been a Stillwell, at times he's been a Jackson. He's indicted as Shannon Stillwell. I know him as Shannon Stillwell, but throughout this trial, some people may say Shannon Jackson, some people may say Shannon Stillwell. I may slip up and say Shannon Jackson, but we're talking about the same person, Shannon Stillwell. <coughs> Second preliminary matter, it has not been lost on me that my client, it's not lost on any of us, that my client is charged with two murders in this case. And he's charged in 2015, and the evidence will show that he was wrongfully accused. And that case never went to court. He was accused in 2022, wrongfully, based largely on assumptions made about the 2015 case. We plead absolutely not guilty. With our backs straight and our eyes wide open, we plead not guilty to those charges. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, as far as preliminary matters, um, as you probably have realized, through jury selection and the fact that we have some visitors from the press here today and different, different things about this case, this is somewhat of a unique case. It's drawn some attention. But the thing I want to stress is that this case is no different than any other case in the state of Georgia or the, or the United States of America as far as criminal cases go. And it has the same ground rules as any other case tried in this great union. The ground rules of this case are that the defendant Shannon Stilwell, and all the other defendants are presumed innocent. The state bears the burden of proving their case against all the accused individually. And the state's burden of proof is the highest burden in our system, beyond a reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, um, this, the state started talking in their opening about green, I mean, excuse me, about colors. About colors and hand signs and different markers and gang activity and all the rest. And I anticipate that the state will attempt to bring in colors and their belief about what colors mean in this case. Throughout this case, I'm going to ask you to focus on a couple colors as well just to keep in mind as you hear the evidence. Okay, the first color is dollar bill green. Dollar bill green, as you may guess, is the exact shade of green that the U.S. government uses when printing U.S. currency. And the evidence in this case will show that many of these young men grew up without dollar bill green. The evidence will show, and you'll learn about different areas of Atlanta, Capitol Homes, Jonesboro South, places that have since been revitalized in some ways, 
But back 15 years ago, were not nice places. <coughs> despair, lack of opportunity, poverty, lack of positive role models. You'll hear about Shannon and his upbringing. You'll hear that he grew up in the Forest Cove apartments, which has since been condemned. And he was raised by his paternal grandmother, Betty Jackson. He couldn't live with his mother who had succumbed to drug addiction. And it was his paternal grandmother, Betty Jackson, who raised him. And she raised him in the Forest Cove apartments. And you'll hear that she loved him. Lord loved him to him. Called him her sweet thing. And he called her mom because she was mom. You'll hear that despite the love and guidance that Miss Jackson tried to pour into Mr. Stilwell, at the age of 14, without other people providing him guidance, he dropped out of school. And he decided that he wanted to be a rapper. You'll learn about the rap industry in this case. And you'll learn, you probably already know this, but becoming a rapper is not the same as signing up for a job at Home Depot, where you work for two weeks and you get your first paycheck. When you're chasing superstar in the rap game, those paychecks might not come for a long time. And sadly, they may not come at all. It might be a dead end to nowhere. <clears throat> You'll learn about the vast numbers of young men with the same dream as Shannon and how the supply of potential rappers greatly exceeds the demand for superstar rappers. I was really a bad occupation to try to get into when it really comes down to. But Shannon was 14. And you'll hear how he tried to hone his skills and tried to make it in the rap game. But you'll hear that Shannon, like many other young men chasing the same dream, weren't making any money. And bills have to be paid. And kids have to eat. And rent becomes due. And in this case, and we're not going to hide from it, the chase of Dollar Bill Green turned into a different shade of green for Shannon and many others. That type of green, that shade of green is called Bud Green, which is actually a color. You can paint your house Bud Green. But in, it, in, in this case, of course, Bud Green stands for marijuana. And you'll hear how Shannon, trying to make it in rap, sold marijuana. The state has alleged in their over acts, okay? These are acts that they claim prove that there's some RICO conspiracy afoot. You'll hear that on August 23rd, 2013, Shannon was charged with possession of marijuana with intent to distribute, approximately one ounce, over 10 years ago. And you'll hear here that he pled guilty and did his time. You'll hear that in 2015, in July of 2015, he was charged with possession of marijuana with intent and possession of a firearm. And you'll hear he pled guilty, took responsibility, did his time. You'll hear that in September 25th of 2019, he was arrested and charged with possession of a firearm. And he took responsibility and he did his time. We're not hiding from the fact that Shannon Stilwell has sold drugs. We're not hiding from the fact that he's been found in possession of marijuana. We're not hiding from the fact that he's been found in possession of a firearm, which is always synonymous with selling drugs. Okay. These, are his, these are his path, his past, his truth, and they were his decisions. His motivation was to make money for him to live, to pay rent, to eat. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we're not hiding from the past. But the evidence will show that Shannon's decisions starting over 10 years ago had nothing to do with YSL or any other organization. You won't hear evidence that Shannon was selling marijuana and then calling someone from YSL saying, hey, I got some money to, to support the organization or calling Jeffrey Williams and saying, hey, I got some money for you, man. No, it was for him. He was a drug dealer. He pled guilty. He did his time. Just like thousands of other people in Atlanta. This has nothing to do with YSL. has nothing to do with the January 10th shooting of Donovan Thomas. And it has nothing to do with the 2022 shooting of Shemal Franks. On count one, on this indictment, the state charges Shannon Stilwell with <clears throat> conspiracy to violate the RICO Act. And they say an honor between January 24, 2013 and the 8th day of May 2022, he and others unlawfully conspired to acquire, <clears throat> maintain directly and indirectly an interest in and control of United States currency and other personal property through a pattern of racketeering. The state in their opening said, further the interests of YSL, further their goals. They also said they endeavored to do, to do a lot of stuff, to get them a lot of stuff. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated. And Rico, the actions need to be part of a racketeering organization, not a drug dealer selling drugs to put food on his own table. So for a studio time to chase his pain as a rat. I'm going to ask you, as a close of evidence, to find Shane Stilwell not guilty. Count one. Okay. The other color, besides dollar bill green and I guess bill bud green that I'd like to talk about, is Fulton County blue. Now Fulton County blue refers to the Fulton County Jail, 901 Rice Street, where people are taken when they're arrested for felony charges in Fulton County. And Fulton County Blue refers to the jumpsuits that these individuals wear, the, the county-issued jumpsuits that are typically navy blue, but deep navy blue, and say Fulton County inmate on the back. You'll hear about the conditions of jail life and Fulton County jail life in particular. And common sense dictates some of this. You're com confined to a cell, sometimes with another man sharing that small cell with you. You have no privacy. Use the bathroom in front of men, shower in front of men. You're in fear, danger. You're separated from your family and your loved ones. But most importantly, the Men wearing blue, Fulton County blue, they've lost control of their lives. They've lost control of their destiny. Their destiny is now in the hands of the judicial system, in the hands of prosecutors. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Fulton County blue is going to be a very important color in this case because the state's key witnesses, witnesses in this case that they're going to call to testify, that I anticipate that they will call to testify against my client, Shannon Stilwell. When they became involved in this case, they were all wearing the Fulton County blue. When Gary Zachary, Kenneth Goldman, Sammy Davis, Tremont Stilwell, Spencer Wright will hear and testify if they're called. You'll hear what they've said previously, perhaps. But what you should keep in mind is, when did these men say what they have to say? Did they say it when they first got the information to share? Or the, the, when they claim they got the, first got the information to share? 
Or did they share it when they found themselves wearing the Fulton County blue? When they no longer had control of their destinies and they needed a favor. And they decided to insert themselves into a high profile case that could solve all their problems. Okay. Let's talk about January 10, 2015. That's the case involving uh, Mr. Thomas. And uh, this was, the evidence will show that this was a high profile case. And the reason, and, and, and I, this is not me talking. I anticipate the evidence will show. I anticipate the state's own witnesses, the state's own gang investigators will tell you, not me talking. I anticipate they will tell you that Donovan Thomas was a big deal, that he was a gang leader, that he was a leader of the Inglewood family bloods in Atlanta, that he was high ranking. And that's what made this case a big deal on the streets. You'll also hear that this, this case, the shooting of Donovan Thomas, was caught on surveillance video. Now, I'm not going to suggest that it's the highest quality surveillance video, but it was caught on surveillance video. And you'll be able to watch the surveillance video. And you'll see McDaniel Street in downtown Atlanta at about 7.20 p.m. on January 10, 2015. Remember, winter, it's cold, um, dark. And you'll see a car zoom down McDaniel Street towards Northside Drive, headed northwest, I believe. And you'll, you'll see and you will hear testimony that Mr. Thomas was with other individuals. Um, what they were doing, I don't know, but he was with other individuals in a parking lot in between two barber shops, one being Mr. George's barber shop and one being Mr. Bernard's barber shop. And you will hear that this car zoomed down this dark street on that January night. And it appears from the video that you will see that an individual starts shooting out of the sunroof in the direction of Donovan Thomas and others. And you'll see that surveillance video for what it is and what it isn't. And you will also see how quickly everything occurred that night. A matter of seconds. Detective Thorpe is the Atlanta Police Department detective that was assigned this case in January 2015. And you'll hear that he that he gathered the evidence from the crime scene. There was no DNA, there was no fingerprints of value. Um, you'll hear that there were shell casings. All, all along the street, but you won't ever hear that these shell casings were linked to any particular gun or Shannon Stillwell or anything else. And there were no eyewitnesses on January 10, 2015, coming forward saying, yes, I was here, and this is what I saw, and I saw this person do this. There was none of that. And you will hear that this case remained unsolved no one had been charged for nine months and nine days. On October 19, 2015, nine months and nine days after the Donovan, Donovan Thomas shooting, a man named Nicholas Robinson was arrested on the streets of Atlanta and brought to Fulton County Jail for various pending charges. And you will hear evidence that Mr. Robinson decided he needed help. He didn't want to wear the Fulton County blue. You will hear that he contacted Atlanta Police Department and got in touch with Detective Thorpe 
And Detective Thorpe came out in an interview with this Nicholas Robinson. You'll hear what Nicholas Robinson said in this interview. How he gave his vantage point to Detective Thorpe. How Nicholas Robinson said that he was seated at the Marta bus bench right across McDaniel Street from the barber shops. And you'll hear that Nicholas Robinson told Detective Thorpe that he saw it all. And he saw the people that were inside the car. And he gave names. Nicholas Robinson said, I saw Antonio Sledge. He came out of the sunroof shooting. I saw Kenneth Copeland. He was in the front passenger seat. I saw Demetrius Garlington. He was the driver of this car. Quinarius Zachary, he wasn't there, but he supplied the gun to Antonio Sledge. And yes, I saw Shannon Stilwell, my client, in the back passenger side shooting a handgun. So Detective Thorpe, after taking this information from Nicholas Robinson, who just broke the case, created photo lineups. And you'll learn what a photo lineup is. It's essentially six photos that, um, that contain a picture of a suspect and then five what we call fillers. And you'll learn about that. And, he, and Detective Thorpe showed these photo lineups, a photo lineup with Antonio Sledge and a photo lineup with Kenneth Copeland. Each person had their own photo lineup just to ensure that Nicholas Robinson could pick these people out of a photo lineup. And Nicholas Robinson did. And he signed his name, Nicholas Robinson, next to the picture of Antonio Sledge, and next to the picture of Kenneth Copeland, and next to the picture of Quindarius, I mean, Demetrius Garlington, and next to the picture of my client, Shannon Stilwell. Nicholas Robinson signed his name and said, these were the people in the car. Ladies and gentlemen, why am I telling you this? Well, Detective Thorpe had two small problems. First, you will see the surveillance video. You will be able to watch the surveillance video and the lighting conditions out there and the fact that there's gunfire going every which way and how fast the car is moving. And you will be able to judge, was it ever even believable that someone could see four people inside the car under those conditions? But there was a bigger problem that Detective Thorpe had. You see, you'll learn that during this interview with Nicholas Robinson, it wasn't only Detective Thorpe. There was another investigator there, an investigator Gaither. And while Detective Thorpe was talking to Nicholas Robinson, Detective Gaither was doing some investigation of her own and looking into Nicholas Robinson and who this guy was who had just been arrested. And after Nicholas Robinson picked out all these people, including my client, Detective Gaither had to tell Detective Thorpe a little secret. Detective Gaither had to tell Detective Thorpe that guy in there, just signed those photo lineups, they just held their case. His name isn't really Nicholas Robinson. He lied to us about his name. His name is actually Spencer Wright. So, case was solved by someone who lied about their name. So, what was Detective Thorpe's solution? Well, this is what the evidence will show. Detective Thorpe completely overlooked the lie about the, the improbability of a man spotting four different individuals in the car moving at a high rate of speed in the middle of the night. He overlooked those things. And he said to Nicholas Robinson, or he said to Spencer Wright, uh, yeah, I, I've come to learn that your name is not actually Nicholas Robinson, it's Spencer Wright. Could you look at these photo lineups again? And instead of writing a fake name, Nicholas Robinson, could you actually sign that your real name, Spencer Wright? And Spencer Wright did. And 
what happened? Detective Thorpe, on October 19, 2015, based on the word of Spencer Wright, the man who had just claimed to be Nicholas Robinson, Detective Thorpe took out warrants for Antonio Sledge, Demetrian Garlington, Kenneth Copeland, and my client, Shannon Stillman. Based on what Spencer Wright said. Okay. Since October 19th of 2015, people have had an opportunity to review some things on this case. The surveillance video that you will see, it's interesting because not only does it show me Daniel Street to catch the incident, but it also shows the Marta Park bench right across from the barber shops on McDaniel Street. And know who's in the barber shop, know who's in the park bench? The bus, Marta bench, across from the barber shop? No one. It was all fabricated. It was all made up. It was all a lie. We've been able to review Spencer Wright's jail phone calls to associates made around that time. All but admitting, I'm lying. I need to get out of here. I'm inserting myself into a case so I can get favorable treatment so that others get arrested. The state has since dismissed the charges against Antonio Sledge, Kenneth Copeland, and Demetrian Garlington. They continue to push forward against Shannon Stillwell. Why is Spencer Wright so important? Why have I spent so much time talking about someone who clearly lied, who clearly wasn't there, who clearly made things up? Well, Spencer Wright gives us the blueprint. He tells us what to look out for. What was Spencer Wright wearing when he fabricated his story? Fulton County Blue. What did he want? What was he in search of when he fabricated his story? Control of his destiny. He didn't want it to be left in the judicial system. He wanted to use something to get a deal. He wanted to take back control. That's what men in blue do. Okay. In this case, I anticipate the state will bring four uh, witnesses forward. All four have certain things in common, as I stated. When they supposedly came upon information that was relevant, never shared it, never shared it to law enforcement. But once they were wearing blue and they needed something, that's when they came up with their stories. I anticipate the state will call Quindaria Zachary, ironically, one of the people accused by Spencer Wright. You'll learn that he claims he knew information from January 10, 2015. January, February, March, April, May. Never shared this information with anyone. But lo and behold, you'll hear he was found himself in custody for serious charges on August 5th of 2015, then all of a sudden he had a story to tell. You'll hear he gave a second statement to law enforcement uh, approximately a year later, where he was in a room <clears throat> with the gang investigators, with prosecutors, including the prosecutors that were handling his case and had control over his destiny, his future, and his attorney. And you'll hear that he gave a second statement and was looking for a deal. Quindary Zachary is no longer wearing blue. Quindary Zachary is not charged in this case. He got his deal. You'll hear about Kenneth Copeland. Again, someone ironically accused by Spencer Wright. You'll hear that Kenneth Copeland 
hates jail more than anything. The problem is, for someone that hates jail more than anything, he does a horrible job of avoiding it. And you'll hear that throughout this investigation, he's repeatedly arrested by Atlanta Police Department and other jurisdictions. And you'll hear two of those arrests were on June 10th of 2015 for guns, found in possession of guns. October 28, 2021, guns, found in possession of guns. And he makes it very clear about what he thinks about wearing the blue. But the interesting thing about him is, as you will hear, is every time he's arrested, law enforcement runs out to talk to him. And he goes to the same song and dance about how he'll do anything, anything. Just don't, please, me, please don't let me, don't make me wear that blue. Kenneth Copeland is no longer wearing blue. And he's not charged in this case. I just think you may hear from a man named Sammy Davis who claims he was at the scene on January 10, 2015. January through December 2015, never once went to law enforcement. 2016, never, one went, never once went to law enforcement. But then in March 17, 2017, when he's in jail, wearing blue, law enforcement comes out and talks to him. You'll hear his story. His story about how Two cars were driving down McDaniel Street, and the first car sent a signal to the second car saying, Donovan Thomas is just leaving the barber shop as a signal like it's time to shoot. And how the second car pulled up in front of the barber cop shop and, and stopped in the middle of the street. Just stopped. And then people started shooting at Donovan Thomas. You'll hear. Sammy Davis' story. You'll also see the video. You'll see that there's no first car, second car. You'll see that there's no signal. You'll see that Donovan Thomas wasn't just leaving the barber shop, that he had, in fact, like the state had already stated, been hanging out with friends in that parking lot for quite some time prior to the shooting. And most importantly, you'll hear, or you'll see on the video, that Sammy Davis claims that this car stopped are 100% wrong. The car never stops. The car drives on by. Bullets flying everywhere. You'll be able to listen to Sammy Davis' story and compare it to the surveillance video and figure out how much value you should give his story. And finally, I anticipate you may hear from a man named Jermon Stilwell. The man who curiously claims he's my client's uncle. Not sure what that's about. You'll hear that he claimed to come across important information in January of 2015. And he claimed he came across this important information while talking to someone with his wife, Vanetta Guffey, right there. You'll hear throughout all of 2015, never said a word to law enforcement. It wasn't until March 22nd, 2016. Guess what color Tremont Silva was wearing at that time? You got it. Well, he was in jail for serious charges and he needed help. He needed help from law enforcement to start to reclaim his destiny, control over his life, to escape the monotony and the filth of the Fulton County Jail. And you'll hear that he claimed to have information. You'll hear that the state, to their credit, went to try to corroborate whatever Jamon Silva was talking about and talked to his wife, who is now deceased. Her name is Benetta Gotti. She is now deceased. But you will hear that she was interviewed on May 11th of 2016, when she was still alive. And you'll hear 
what she had to say about Tremont Stillwell's claims. That what he's saying happened never happened, A, and that Tremont Stillwell is a effing liar. Those are the state's witnesses in this case. Those are their men in blue. Count two of this indictment is the count that charges my client, Shannon Stillwell, along with a whole new group of individuals with the murder of Donovan Thomas. There will be no forensic evidence, there will be no ballistic evidence. There will be no eyewitnesses that presented themselves at the scene to say, I saw this occur. The surveillance video will not give insight as to whether Shannon Stillwell was there or not. The state's case will rest entirely on the word of men in blue. When the evidence is done and it is, is done and the trial is done in this case, I'm going to ask that you return a verdict of not guilty to count two murder. Okay. Hold on one second, Shane. Now, I would like to preview um, a little bit about my client's life after the Donovan Thomas murder. Remember, on October 19th, 2015, the Atlanta Police Department, Detective Thornton, and the news broadcasts to the world, and more specifically to the streets, and more specifically to the Inglewood family blood gang that Donovan Thomas was the head of, that my client was responsible. Based on the word of Spencer Wright, based on the word of someone that even the state is saying lied. First they said it wasn't completely accurate. No, it was a lie. Based on that, they broadcast to everyone that my client was responsible. And there has been repercussions. You'll hear in 2015, people pulled up to my client as he stood outside a store, shot a gun at his head, and grazed his forehead. Thankfully, he's still with us. <clears throat> You'll hear that later in 2015, my client went to go get a fish dinner with the mother of his child and another young lady named Tiara Jones at JJ's Fish at the corner of University and Pryor. And members of the gang spotted them there, stalked that car, drove behind the car, and unleashed bullets upon that car, hitting that poor lady, the driver, Tierra Jones, in the face, killing her, causing the car to crash and spin, breaking bones in my client's body, collapsing his lungs. <clears throat> the streets have not cared that Spencer Wright is a liar. Since that time, my client's life has changed in some small ways and some big ways that I think <laughs> make sense. <clears throat> Shannon Stillwell, since that time, has been careful about his surroundings. He tends to back into parking <clears throat> spots. He tends to run red lights at intersections, not to be a sitting duck for IFA members or anyone else. He habitually changes residences. And yes, he does habitually rent cars, including a white alley. He does this, the evidence will show, so no one can associate him with any particular car. None of the IFA members can know where he is. And yes, when he rents cars, he does tint their windows so no one can see in. That's the life he leads since 2015. 
And yes, when he leaves the house late at night, he does conceal his identity. It was during COVID, but he does wear a mask. That's been Shannon Stillwell's life since 2015. And I'm going to ask that you keep that into account as you consider the evidence as it's presented. Now, seven years later, March 14, 2022, remember, Shannon has been publicly accused, but no one has ever taken that case to court. No one has ever even tried to actually prove the case. They just accused the case. And Shannon has remained a wanted man. Not by the police, but by someone scary. On March 14, 2022, the evidence will show that Shannon, Quamarvius Nichols, Nikion Garlington, and Miles Farley were planning on going to the music studio to work on music. Still chasing it. The evidence will show that Mr. Garlington was a passenger in Mr. Stillwell's and Shannon's rented white Audi with tinted windows. And Mr. Nichols was with Mr. Farley in Mr. Nichols' white Ford Fusion. The evidence, and you'll see in this case, you'll see uh, there are several different surveillance videos that you'll see in this case. The first being the BP vid footage. And that's from the BP at the corner of Fulton Street and Windsor Street in Atlanta. And you'll see the video. And you'll see Mr. Stilwell. No, we will never deny that he was at the BP. We will never deny that. We'll never deny that he was in a white, rented white house. And you'll see Mr. Stillwell pull up on that camera and back into a parking spot right in front of the DP. And you will see Mr. Nichols shortly thereafter in his white Ford Fusion pull up at the gas tank so he can purchase gas to get to the studio. You'll see footage from inside of the store. That's uh, Mr. Nichols, you'll find out that that's Mr. Nichols purchasing an item, and that's Mr. Stillwell, my client, wearing a pink Floyd hoodie with a pink uh, wool cap on. And you'll be able to observe them on video, and you'll see Miles Farley, a third person in their group, a shorter individual, come in, and you'll see them playing around and pushing each other in a playful man manner, as friends do. I'm going to ask you to observe them on a video and ask yourself, does that appear to be men on a mission? Or does it appear to be friends just playing on going in the studio? The video will reveal that at some point, a gentleman by the name of Shamal Drinks pulls up in a red car at, a, at another, uh, in, in fact, I believe that's a picture of it right there at that, at that gas pump. And he enters the store. You'll be able to see the video of him entering the store from the, uh, from the parking lot, and you'll be able to see him inside the store. You'll see that he gets into some sort of argument or altercation, not an altercation, an argument. Um, it appears with the clerk, and he leaves the store, and he gets in his car. There will be no interaction whatsoever between Mr. Drinks and my client, Mr. Drinks and Mr. Farley, Mr. Drinks and Mr. Nichols, Mr. Drinks and Mr. Garlington. There'll be no interaction at all. And you will see Mr. Drinks exit that parking lot and take a right on Windsor Street. And then you will see Mr. Stillwell exit that parking lot and take a right on Windsor Street. And then you'll see Mr. Nichols exit the parking lot and take a right on Windsor Street. And that's where the FedEx surveillance footage will take over. And you'll be able to watch the FedEx footage on Windsor Street, which will show these cars drive up and end up at a red light.
you will see my client's car, white Audi, run a red light. You will see Mr. Nichols follow my client's car and run a red light. Eventually, cars come in to replace him, and traffic flow continues and continues for several minutes. And eventually, a man who is just happened to be going the other way looks into Mr. Drinks' car, which is still sitting there, and notices that Mr. Drinks has been shot. What you will not see on this video is any indication at all that this shooting occurred while my client's car was beside Mr. Drinks. You will not see any muzzle flash, you will not see any commotion, you will not see any fight, you will not see anything at all that suggests that that's when the shooting occurred. So this March 14, 2022 case, what I anticipate is you will not hear any eyewitnesses say that Shannon Stillwell, there, and, and let's be clear, the state is accusing Shannon Stillwell. I mentioned that there's four people in this party. They are accusing Shannon Stillwell of shooting Mr. Drinks out of that white house. The state will not present to you any witnesses that saw this occur. The state will not present to you any forensic evidence that proves that this occurred. The surveillance I submit to you, and you'll be able to see it and judge for yourself, points to the exact opposite, that the shots did not come from Mr. Stillwell's car, nor did, and I'm not suggesting they came from Mr. Nichols either, came from neither car. So why was Shannon Stillwell arrested? Well, they had video of Shannon at the DP. Okay. That's fine, we don't deny that, never will. They made certain assumptions about what would be on that FedEx video that you will be able to look at and determine what it shows and what it doesn't show. And I'm sure they assumed that it would show some shooting, but it doesn't. And finally, they made assumptions about Shannon Stillwell. Remember what the state said in opening about how Detective Hogan had his case. He had people on a video at the BP, which is near where the shooting occurred, but not where the shooting occurred. He had people on his video, and then he talked to another detective, Viverito, and Viverito said, oh, that's Shannon Stillwell. That's Shannon Stillwell. Oh, that's where Marcus Nichols. And they just ran with it. Yeah. Shannon Stillwell was at the BP that night. He didn't shoot Shamal Drinks. None of his friends shot Shamal Drinks. They went to the studio. Since these warrants were taken out for uh, Shannon Stillwell, and I'll tell you the warrants were taken out and Shannon Stillwell was arrested in that same white Audi on March 17, 2022, three days later. Since those warrants have been taken out, some other information has come forward. First, I'm going to ask you, and you will, this will be entered into evidence, I'm going to ask that you consider the rental agreement for the White Audi. You will learn that on March 16th, two days after this alleged shooting, when every other person who has a guilty conscience, anyone who has a guilty conscience is trying to get out of the rental car, Shannon extended his lease. I'm going to ask you to consider and really think about that. Extending a lease of a car that you supposedly just killed someone. Are those the actions of someone who's guilty of that crime? You're going to hear about the wiretap on Demikian Garlington's phone. Remember, Demikian Garlington was in uh, Mr. Stillwell's car. And the state hinted at it a little bit. They, they were talking about uh, Jaden Myrick uh, and people wanting to attack a man named Bucci. And based on these concerns in the jail, 
the state applied for, and you'll learn what a wiretap is, they applied for a wiretap and received a wiretap for Dominion Garlington's phone. The phone of the person who was with Shannon Stillwell on March 14, 2022. And you'll learn what a wiretap is and how a wiretap really consists of law enforcement sitting and listening in on all your phone calls, incoming and outgoing, and recording all the relevant and pertinent phone calls and conversations that occur. You'll learn that this wiretap on Demeke on Garlington's phone began on March, I believe March 10th, but certainly well before March 14th, the date of the Shamala drink shoot. So it was in place that night. Who knows about the wiretap? You'll learn that too. Do you think the government tells you that your phone is being wiretapped? Of course they don't. It's secret. No one knows. That's the point. And you'll learn about who Demikion Garlington is and what type of guy he is. I would submit, if you have a secret, you wouldn't want to tell Demikion Garlington. You'll hear him on the wiretap, drunk, high, talking about everything under the sun, pills, weed, guns, girls, robberies, all stuff that he's involved in, completely against his interests to discuss, but he doesn't know he's being listened to now. But one thing that's interesting, of all the things that this loudmouth talks about, all the crimes, and they said they bragged about this stuff. They said Danica Garlington was bragging about this stuff. All the things they bragged about, no, it never comes up. Shooting anyone on March 14, 2022. All the crimes he discusses, never, that never comes up. <laughs> Finally, and most importantly, the science about this March 14, 2022 case. We're going to learn about gunshot residue. Gunshot residue testing. Testing that tests for microscopic particles that contain a combination of lead, barium, and antimony. Particles that come from the explosion of a gun in the gunshot primer that causes it. synonymous with a fire uh, with a firearm that has been fired who does gunshot residue testing georgia bureau of investigation apd all sorts of agencies to build cases against defendants how is you learn how gunshot residue is collected. How you take a surface or a body part or an object, and you take these adhesive stubs, these adhesive stubs, these official gunshot residue kits, and you dab the surface of an item as much as you want. You can use multiple stubs. And then you take these stubs and you place them under an electronic microscope. And a scientist can look under this microscope and see if there's any particles of gunshot residue that are on said item. You'll hear that Shannon Stillwell was arrested on March 17th in that same white Audi that he was in on the 14th. And you will hear that the crime scene technicians, in this case, made a specific decision to pick the best place on a car to test for gunshot residue. When the gun is fired, the gunshot residue would plume upwards. And so they take the best part of the car, the headliner. And for all of you that don't know what the headliner is, that's the cloth top of the car. That's pictured right there. You'll hear about Alexander Coven, a scientist, a man in search of the truth, a man who works for GBI, not for me, not for Shannon Stillwell. And you'll hear how he, that headliner that was collected from that white Audi on March 17th was brought to Alexander Coven 
at the, at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. You know, here he's an expert in gunshot residue collection and analysis and detection. And you'll hear how Mr. Colvin, as he was trained, took that gunshot residue kit, and took those adhesive tabs, and dabbed that headliner again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. Dozens of times. And then he wanted to make sure he, 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 what he did was sufficient. So he took a second tab, adhesive tab, a fresh one, and continued to dab that headliner again and again and again and again and again to pick up any particles that would be on the headliner from that white outing. And he, he took those tabs, those adhesive tabs, and he put him, them under his microscope that he uses when he's building cases for the state. And he looked at those tabs under that microscope for any particle of gunshot residue, any at all. Looking for 15, 10, 5, 3, 1, whatever he could see. And you'll hear that on June 3rd, 2022, 77 days after the state, after Detective Hogan, Investigator Viverito, and the state made their decision that Shannon Jackson fired a gun, Chin Stillwell fired a gun from that white Audi, 77 days after they made that decision, you'll hear that scientist Colvin released his report. Not in that headliner, there was not a single, zero, gunshot resin to be found. That's the science. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, regarding the uh, March 14, 2022 case, uh, the state has made five charges, five different counts against Shannon Stillwell, my client. First, is count 49 on this indictment. It is murder, alleging that he shot out of the white Audi and shot Shamal Drinks. The science belies those accusations. I'm gonna ask you to find Shannon Stillwell not guilty of that count. Now count 50 and 51 deal with violations of the criminal street game Gang Activity Act, and they are essentially charges that say that Mr. Stillwell committed murder to further the interests of YSL, and he committed murder on behalf of YSL for the purposes of increasing his standing within the gang. Y'all are smart people. Obviously, I don't need to say it, but it'll make me feel better if I say it. If he's not guilty of count 49 murder, he cannot be gu guilty of count 50, and he cannot be gu guilty of count 51. Counts 52 and 54 similarly charge Shannon Stillwell with possession of a firearm by a convicted felon on March 14th of 2022 on the belief that he used a firearm to kill Shamal Drinks. <laughs> If the state does not prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt, he cannot be found guilty of count 52. And in count 54, charges Shannon Stillwell with possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, that felony being murder. Obviously, if he didn't commit the murder, then he cannot be in possession of a firearm during the commission of said felony. <laughs> My client has been charged with two separate murders. He's been wrongfully accused of two separate murders, and we plead absolutely not guilty. He's been charged with conspiracy to violate the RICO Act. And while now he has sold marijuana in the past, those were his decisions for his benefit and had nothing to do with YSL or anyone else involved in this case. He's pled guilty to those charges. He's done his time. 
and that makes him an ex-drug dealer. It doesn't make him a conspirator. It doesn't make him guilty of violating any RICO acts. The ground rules. Shane Silva is presumed innocent. The state bears the burden of proof, and the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. I believe in this case, if you focus on where the state's evidence comes from, you will find that primarily it comes from the stories of men wearing blue. I'm going to ask you to focus on things like science instead of stories. Compare the credibility of a scientist like GBI scientist Cole, who followed all the rules and determined there was absolutely zero gunshot residue in that outcome. Compare that to what the state presents. Spencer Wright, who said his name was Nicholas Robinson, who lied to get out of jail. Spencer Wright duped Detective Thorpe on October 19, 2015. And that is on Detective Thorpe. I am going to do my best to make sure that the truth comes out in this case. Make sure that no one wearing blue will be able to dupe anyone during this trial. My client, Shannon, G Shannon Stillwell, is not guilty. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, how you doing? It's 5.30. All right, consistent with my earlier promise to see you, uh, I think it might be a, a natural stopping point for us to put a pin in today and for us to um, come back tomorrow, unless you all object to the, my suggestion. Hearing no objection, I think we're going to go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and kind of review a couple of things to begin with. Okay. All right, first thing is when you go back into your headquarters jury deliberation room, dump your notepads, okay? Uh, hopefully everybody's written their name in the inside cover of those freaking ones like I told you earlier. But if you haven't done so, go ahead and do so. Take a juror sticker and put it in your pocket, your purse, or whatever carrier device you have so that when you come back in tomorrow morning, we'll go ahead and um, you can put that on as soon as you get into the, or clear, as you come in through the being screened in the courthouse, okay? All right, um, you've kind of figured out already uh, for tomorrow if you need, and I think I mentioned to you this earlier, a lot of you wearing jackets and everything else, it's easier, like I said, for you to put on a jacket or for you to take off something than it is for me to kind of regulate the temperature. So um, please bring whatever it is that will make you comfortable tomorrow, um, that uh, your jacket or otherwise. Okay, that's kind of the administrator. And if you're running late uh, tomorrow, as I mentioned earlier, let Ms. Uh, Umana know. But remember, I can't start until I've accounted for all 18 of you. So it's very important you, again, as I mentioned earlier, only you know how long it takes for you to get down here to Fulton County from wherever you live in our great county. So just plan accordingly. Leave a little bit earlier. It's always easier for you to sit back there and just kind of relax and don't be so stressed. That is for you to kind of leave late and that just kind of just puts you in, uh, puts you in kind of a, a position that you probably are stressed already when you get here. So I'd advise you to do that. Okay. You remember all my ad and admonitions? They still apply, okay? So, very important, I mean, you, you, that you not talk about the case amongst each other as you're walking out. Do not talk about the case as you're in your headquarters, your liberation room. Don't go on any social media sites. 
Do not let anybody friend you. Do not and do not do any of the other things that I've told you earlier. Like research anything, go buy any scenes, take any photographs. Or otherwise, try and uh, educate yourself to some things that you may have heard in the courtroom today. Remember, the only things you can consider are what's lawfully presented within the four walls of this courtroom. So it's very important that you consider and keep the court's admonitions, which I know you will continue to do so. There is great temptation when you go home tonight. Hey, what happened in court? I saw you on TV. Are you supposed to respond to that? No, you're not. And you can blame me. You can even tell Judge Glenn will say for you not to do that, all right? Because remember, your doing that would affect, and if we found out about it, would affect your, our ability to have a fair trial, a just trial, a lawful trial as to all parties. So please adhere to that um, uh, admonition and all the others, okay? Remember, nobody's supposed to have any ancillary or incidental contact with you. If anybody tries to reach out to you, uh, I need to know about it so you can tell Sergeant Ingram or any of my team um, if anybody should try and do so, okay? And consistent with my instructions uh, when you're here before, uh, we'll go ahead and get you squared away for those of you that are taking the shuttle and for those of you that need to make other alternative arrangements. We have uh, we have just get with Sergeant Ingram. He'll go ahead and, um, and coordinate that for you, okay? All right, so you're probably wondering, what time are we going to start tomorrow morning? I need you all here to, to be here by 10 o'clock, okay? We will start somewhere between 10 and 10.30 tomorrow morning, uh, and I'll do that, try and give that to you every single night that we conclude, tell you what time in the morning you need to come by, come to be here. That's your target or mark time you need to be here in the morning. Try and get here a little bit earlier because then, like I said, you'll be a whole lot more at peace, and then as soon as we... At 10 o'clock or there rounds, I can find out if all 18 of you are here, and I don't have to look for anybody. And then I can go ahead and we can get started uh, once we've, uh, we're ready to, ready to pick up from where we left off from, from today. Okay? So, 1,000 hours tomorrow, you need to be in your headquarters. Okay, I think I've gone through all the things I need to with you. Any ministerial inquiry of me at this point in time, ladies and gentlemen? Anything from me? Questions? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience with us. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, and I mentioned through this entirety of the process, the patience that you've given us are giving us today and will continue to give us throughout the consideration of this matter. So unless you have any other um, query or questions for me, um, you for t until tomorrow morning and bid you comfort and uh, we'll see you in the morning we'll start up when you all get here at um, at 10 hundred hours okay all right so with that ladies and gentlemen have a good evening all rise.